happened here before. Um, if you do want to participate, you go down to the reactions uh, icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and press raise hand. Um, from there, we will uh, call on you and you can, you can speak at a later point in time. Um, if you're calling in from the phone, it's star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. We're here, Anthony. Yes. Marco is here. Let's see who's here. <clears throat> okay, I think we should begin. Uh, as it is 6.30. Um, this is the uh, January meeting of the Zoning and uh, Development Committee. And um, I'd like to welcome all of you. And um, uh, I am uh, uh, one co-chair, Anthony Cohn. The other is Elizabeth Ashby, who is somewhere on your screens. And um, but before we begin the, the formal part of our program, um, I'd like um, Max to unmute Elaine Walsh and um, for her to say a few words. Go ahead, Elaine. I've unmuted you. Thank you, Max. Sure. Tonight, you see we have a new co-chair for zoning. I was removed, but the new board chair Russell Squires. I hope that in my tenure as a co-chair, I met the commitment to preserve a zoning for our community. While I'm not sure what happened, I must tell you that what Russell told me was that I would be removed. I'm so delighted that Anthony joins Elizabeth in co-chairing one of the most important committees in our community. I thank you for your support. I look forward to continue to work with you all. And I will continue to speak about the issues related to zoning, whether they are uncomfortable or they're acceptable. But I wanna thank the community groups for Northwell and the Blood Center and the 210 Heights that have been so responsive to wanting to preserve our community. And on that, I wanna thank you all. And I wanna give best to Anthony and Elizabeth to call forward or move forward with our agenda, which will not change. That is my understanding and that we succeed in our challenges in the local community. So thank you very much for, my, for allowing me some time to speak and um, <clears throat> let's go back to the meeting. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Elaine. And, and when Jefferson presented it himself to the French court in 1785, Louis XVI greeted him. So, Mr. Jefferson, you are to replace Dr. Franklin. No, your majesty, I follow Dr. Franklin. No one can replace him. So thank you, Elaine, and I hope to continue to see you here um, all the time. Um, and I think Elizabeth wanted to say something as well. Yes, I think that 
the last years that you and I have co-chaired uh, this committee, uh, you've been essential to the character of our neighborhood. Uh, I think that I wouldn't even consider the committee existing uh, unless you're, you were co totally involved uh, as we go forward in the future. And I know that uh, Anthony and I regard you as our partner in going forward. And uh, the community board owes you a great deal of thanks for what you've done thus far. And I'm so glad that we're going to have your total involvement and we couldn't manage without it as we go forward. Okay, so we're going well, to... And yeah. Anthony, for your kind words. Oh, your pleasure, our pleasure. Um, Elizabeth, I think you were going to talk about the blood center. Yeah, uh, I was, uh, I want to just introduce it uh, because uh, we uh, have asked representatives of both the first two items, uh, the blood center and the one that Anthony will in introduce. Uh, in the future, we've asked them several times and they just are not coming, but the community is here and the, uh, we want to hear from you uh, uh, about what you're doing, what you have found out, what your position is, because this, uh, in our opinion, and the community board has taken this position, that this is a seriously damaging uh, proposal to rezone the uh, uh, blood center site from a mid block. It's in the mid block. It's correctly zoned in the mid block. They want to change it so they can put a 516 foot tower and rent this, uh, keep the bottom space, which is would be perfectly legal and suits, suits their needs, and um, build a tower that uh, to be rented out. So with that. Uh, uh, Max, would you uh, recognize the speakers on this subject? This is the subject of the Blood Center, and we want to hear from you. I, I think first, um, members of the public, um, just just a quick sort of more specific update. There was a, um, a, a, a scoping meeting, public meeting on December 15th, um, and uh, to wit, at which um, Alita Camp uh, from Community Board 8 uh, uh, presented testimony. And then there was a, an additional period up until New Year's Eve um, at wit, uh, during which um, the public were allowed to provide uh, uh, additional comments. Uh, the, the point of scoping for those who don't know is for the um, Department of City Planning to determine what topics have to be covered and in what specific way they have to be covered in the environmental impact statement. And um, so uh, Community Board 8 submitted a very long, um, uh, a very long list of additional items that were requested as did uh, the borough president. And uh, there is no specific timetable for the total responses to that, but um, sort of that's where that is. And so members of the public maybe, well, it looks like we have um, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein first. Go ahead, Betty. Betty, if you're there, that's uh, star six to unmute. Hi, thank you very much. I did call in exactly at 6.30, but I somebody was speaking and I didn't get the name of the person who spoke and I would like to know who that was and then I wanted to say something. Uh, it, when it began. 
Yes, Elaine Walsh spoke. No, no, before Elaine, someone who, who opened it, who oh, opened the, me, the session. Anthony yes. Cohn, yes. Oh, okay, Anthony, all right, because I didn't hear you. You Probably everybody could see you, but I don't have that ability. I'm right. just I'm able to call in, not to see. I, um, I'm very, very uh, concerned and upset, having learned this morning that Elaine is no longer the co-chair. I think that she has done a magnificent job over a long period. I remember her for the long period that I was on the board some time back. But what we used to do, if someone was interested in the committee, and you can always use people who are interested, uh, we once did add someone. We, we didn't eliminate anyone. We added someone else who joined. And that turned out to be good because not, you know, everybody has schedules and sometimes they can't make it. And so it's always important to have the two people, but it's also good to have a third person. So it concerns me, and I will like to know um, how this happened. And then I do want to respond to what we're talking about tonight. But I mean, I've, I'm just shocked. I've, I've never seen anything like this from our board or from any board I've been on. So well, I don't know if you want to respond to that, Anthony, or who responds. Well, the only thing I would the, the only thing I would say, and uh, Russell is not here. No, um, the, the only thing I would say is that um, it it it's uh, um, it was a decision made by the new board chair, and um, I think. Um, it only he only Russell can actually um, speak to um, the motivation. Um, and with that, I'm afraid since he isn't here, I'm afraid um, it'll have okay, to remain I just want to, mm -hmm. That's okay. I just want to make sure it's part of the record, and I will be sure to call and speak with him tomorrow. So now coming to uh, tonight. Um, the um, committee has certainly worked very hard to get the material and get everything done and sent in. The community, um, I'm happy, is on, and they will speak because we've had a wonderful community response, as well as the rest of the board, in not supporting this change of zoning. But the the parties because we have two issues today. And in neither one, as a matter of fact, as far as the hospital is concerned, they didn't even show up uh, the last time. And uh, neither one has really expressed any real interest in working well with the community or with the board. So I'm going to be very interested to find out just what we are going to be able to do when we have a, a, you know, when we're trying to do something with people who don't want to work with us. So I hope the rest of the community will also, I know, I know they will have some good comments to make as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'd like to report that the uh, uh, borough president has sent us a, a copy of her statement on uh, the blood center and, uh, she shares the concerns of the community. Mm -hmm. The blood center, I think, uh, had some alternative facts when they said that uh, she supported their proposal. Everybody admires the blood center. And we will go to the public first. Uh, and the next member of the public is Rachel Levy. Hi everyone. Um, thanks so much for recognizing me. Um, I, you know, I um, think as like all of you, I think the reasons to oppose the blood center in terms of the zoning questions are well documented. Um, but I just wanted to raise an additional issue that has come to light for us recently in case others don't know. Um, but we learned recently that the blood center uh, building will contain BSL three labs. Um, if you, like me, are unaware what that means, um, it's a CDC classification, um, the third of highest of four classifications. 
for high containment research facilities. Um, and basically a lot of these high level, high containment research facilities started to proliferate throughout the country um, after 2001. And there's not a lot of tracking of these. In 2016, the Department of Health issued a memo um, basically saying that the city doesn't know how many facilities like this are in the city, um, what hazardous agents they store and handle, and that if there were to be an accident in one of these BSL-3 or 4 level high containment research labs, it would have, and I'm quoting, catastrophic consequences. Um, so that's one piece. And then on the other hand, also in 2016, we found some guidance that was issued as part of the EDC's Life Sciences Initiative, basically allowing um, commercial research laboratories in C2 districts and higher um, that would be, you know, potentially throughout the city. And so I think that the public health angle to this is something worth considering. Um, we had previously been focused very much on the zoning precedent and the fact that this doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood, but I think um, we're still learning more. I don't know exactly. I've, we've asked some more questions of the blood center, like um, how much of the building will be the BSL-3 labs, whether it will be just for the commercial portion or just for the blood center portion. Currently, as I understand, um, the blood center is not a BSL-3 facility. And I'm, I'm working to figure out um, where other similar labs are located in the city, but there aren't many of them. There are a few on the east side. There's one at Rockefeller University, um, while Cornell I think has one, the research institutions. But to my mind, this is basically a speculative high containment level research facility where we don't know the tenants that are going to be there, not under the umbrella of a respected, I mean, of, a, you know, of an institution that has kind of a guiding mission, um, assuming that this is for the commercial portion of the building. And I, for me, it raises, and for friends, it raises a lot of new issues um, that we'll be looking into. And I wanted to make sure that's on the table for people's consideration. Thank you very much. You. And our next speaker from the, uh, we are aware of these health issues. We have some of these, this information, and I think it all proves that the state is correctly zoned now. Um, the next speaker from the public is Bill Angelos. Can I mute him? Where is he? Could someone He's, find uh, he, Bill Angelos? I have. He's unmuted. You can you can speak, Bill. I see him. I see him speaking, but uh, no one hears him. I, I suspect. No, we do not hear him. Uh, yeah. I don't see him either. But then... if we can't hear, we'll come back to him and go to. Can you hear me now? Um, yes. yes. Okay, yes. great. Okay, great. Well, there you go. Again, my name is Bill Angelos. I'm the board president of 301 East 66th Street. And there's one of the issues I'd like to bring up to the board or the committee is that I'm very surprised and disappointed at the Friends of St. Catherine Park. Uh, they're not being responsive and also uh, to the blood center proposed uh, rezoning redevelopment. It has been uh, shown in their report that they will, the highway will cast a shadow on the park, which is the peak, uh, during the peak hours use of the park. And which is really surprising that the board members of the Friends of St. Catherine Park did not come out oppose it. I mean, who are they represent? Who are they? Do they truly represent the interest of the park? Do they truly support the community in their, in their opposition to the Blood Center proposed um, redevelopment? What is the park without the sunlight? Let's all let you know about the uh, Friends of St. Catherine Park that I believe that this should be addressed. I truly don't believe that they're representing the interest of the park. That is my concern regarding the uh, Francis St. Catherine Park. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, and the next speaker from the public is Samuel Longair. Longair? Uh, yes, hello. Can, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Uh, yes. I just have a very quick comment, sorry, in response to Rachel's comments about the facility. Um, so actually this is Sam's husband, Evan, uh, here in the Upper East Side for eight years. I'm a neuroscientist and oncologist at Weill Cornell with extensive experience in BSL-3 plus facilities. And I, I just respond by saying BSL-3 plus is a fairly common um, uh, categorization for certain facilities where uh, viruses are worked on. And these viruses are things like, um, like HIV and in some cases influenza and other viruses that are fairly common in the US population. Um, I just wanna sort of uh, relay that much more dangerous virus that you've heard about like Ebola, measles, mumps, uh, very, very highly, tuberculosis, highly contagious infectious particles worked on in these facilities, that's BSL-4 of which there are only about a dozen or so facilities in the country that work on those. So containment of big, huge spills and things like that in a BSL-3+, plus, those uh, would be relatively uh, easily and not very infectious to a large population. So you don't have having a huge Ebola outbreak in the city. Those types of facilities would never be approved in New York City. In fact, there are no facilities of the kind. So just, just wanted to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, now we'll go to the board. Uh, the first is Marco Tamayo. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, if you allow. Oh, we you lost know. you, Marco. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, um, I've had to talk, uh, I had to tell about uh, uh, Elaine. Elaine, I met when I was doing my master's degree in the Northern Planning at Hunter College. I have tremendous respect with her and all my classmates have tremendous respect with her, especially for the way that I used to handle all the classes at Hunter. Then after that, uh, about 12 years ago, I met Elaine again, but now Elaine was my fellow community member, along with two other ladies, uh, Elizabeth Ashby and uh, Terry Slater. They used to be called the Three Musketeers because they, with good quality and finesse and uh, class, used to fight all, with all the, the developers in favor of the quality of life in our neighborhood. That's the only thing I had to say about that. Thank you, but now, Talking about the blood center, presently there are 55 millions of square feet of commercial space available according with Adam Wall. So the supply is bigger than the demand. Then the proposed laboratories are only a distraction for the approval because this applicant is looking to changing from RAB to C27 commercial district. That is the key all of that, C27 C27, which has the following groups, five through nine and 14. So these groups will be become as a right of development. This means that this applicant cannot show up to us to change for any of these uses. He can go directly to DOB and approve one of these following uses. In group five, there are hotels used for transition housing shelters, like we just approved on 91st Street. Group six, uh, eating and drinking establishment, courthouse, fire stations, among others. Group seven, transient accommodation motels. Group eight, bowling alleys, theaters, and public service establishment, prisons. Group nine, banquet halls, catering establishment, establishment and, among others. So the, the issue is right now there is a, a great supply of, of, a square for, uh, of a spaces for any use. And obviously at that time, at this time, a uh, blood center is proposing to, to increase the, the supply, which basically will be unsuccessful 
because there are a lot of competition and therefore it's more likely that go in the other direction ready to go what I'm proposing to us. And that we have to be very careful. And I strongly oppose to approve the C27-7. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you, Marco. The next speaker is Sherry Wiener. Thank you, Elizabeth. I have to say I was really taken by surprise to hear that uh, Elizabeth, that Elaine Walsh was removed as a co-chair of zoning and development. With so many zoning challenges facing uh, Community Board 8, it just seems I really question what the motivation of uh, our new chair was to make a replacement at this time. No reflection on Anthony, but we know it's Elaine who's been leading the fight against uh, uh, these zoning violations. But the point I wanted to make is that uh, we were made aware in the patch that Rockefeller University is putting in a 26,000 square foot new incubator life science lab uh, in, in uh, working with Sloan Kettering and Cornell Wild. This is, exact, this is uh, Rockefeller is located at York between 63rd and 68th Street. So we're talking in the same neighborhood. It seems to me as a layperson that we are duplicating the services that the blood center is saying we need so desperately. And I think it strengthens our argument that there is no, that the blood center should say the blood center and there's no need for them to seek zoning changes because uh, they need to bring in commercial tenants. And I think that's a very good point that we just became aware of that we don't need the commercial tenants. Let the blood center stay as of right and let them not violate the mid block zoning. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker uh, is Alita Camp. Thank you, Elizabeth. Huh? Um, thank you, Elizabeth. I want to say that the community board <laughs> have filed a 34 page document before the end of the year of in, with respect to the, uh, the draft environmental impact statement and going to city planning about the blood center raising many, many, many questions in every category that is under the seeker um, rules with respect to environmental analysis, except for being on the waterfront because it isn't on the waterfront. Um, the blood center, as it said, that it doesn't need the space. If it could build as of right, then the only reason for the space would be the leasing of commercial labs. And there is no reason to, to disrupt the entire neighborhood, set a very dangerous precedent with zoning. And I don't know how to do this, but I'd like to ask that there either be a letter or a resolution asking for asking the city for all information about those labs. And I'm conscious of what Sam, um, and I'm sorry, is it Long Air had, uh, had mentioned earlier, but asking the city where those labs are located, if there are any in residential neighborhoods, what kinds of restrictions are provided, what the city rules are, be because uh, maybe there is no appropriate zoning in a residential neighborhood for that particular type of lab. So thank you. Thank you very much, Elida. Uh, next speaker is Rita Popper. I just want to take, I, I have two things to talk about. One is Elaine. Um, I know nothing about zoning uh, other than what was handed in a handbook. And I was glad there was no take home exam. And I do want to thank her for sharing her knowledge with us. And I, I honestly believe there should be a triumvirate committee. That said, um, that will get settled someplace else. Hearing this, and we've talked this blood center several times, we had something very similar to this with uh, Sloan Kettering uh, building um, a, over a, a, in a um, garbage uh, parking lot. Uh, and they were going, uh, mm -hmm. the, the zoning for that particular 
uh, spot was that anybody who wanted to build had to build and keep the sanitation garage underneath. And nobody, of course, answered the RFP. So they came back with a new RFP that if it was for health and education, that would be fine and they wouldn't have to keep the garage. Well, the rest is Hunter was coming and Sloan Kettering. And of course, Hunter never came, but Sloan Kettering did. But to the public, let me tell you what we did is that you have to organize all the people in your area from 72nd to however you want, get all the tenants associations, you're going to need money, you're going to have to hire a land use lawyer and you have to do it rather quickly. The land use lawyer that we used before was sensational, but he has retired. That was Al Butzel. And you have to put stuff together and you have to get before the city council. You have to get organized. We, we are finding out information for you on a piecemeal basis. You need to get, I mean, if I were you, I would get legal help as soon as possible. I wish you luck. Oh, oh thank, you, Rita. thank you, Rita. That's very good advice for the, our fellow citizens. Uh, where are we? Ed Hartzog is the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, apologies to my uh, fellow board members and the public for my uh, very casual appearance uh, in front of you this evening. Um, but I'm doing a little home, homework uh, here. But I wanted to make a couple of comments and you've heard them before, so I'll be quick. But first of all, I would like to say how incredibly shocked, disappointed, and utterly befuddled uh, why our new chair chose um, and before I say this, no disrespect to Anthony Cohen, who is a spectacular member of this board, in his knowledge, but why someone like Elaine Walsh, who is just a stalwart on this committee, and is knowledge that you cannot read about. And I say this as a 10-year member of Community Board 8. And when I joined 10 years ago, I thought, like so many people, oh, well, you know, you're so educated. You got your graduate degree, you got your law degree, you know everything, you don't know squat. I learned very quickly that I knew nothing, zip, that to sit down and to be quiet and to listen to people on this board who have a great deal of experience. People who I'm looking at now, like Michelle Birnbaum, Elizabeth Ashby, people who have been on here, if I miss you, it's only because I don't see you on the screen and we have so many people here tonight. People like Terry Slater, our dear departed colleague, we loved dearly, who was incredibly knowledgeable. So I just say that uh, as a heartfelt loss, I'm glad Elaine is still with us on the board, but I'm incredibly disappointed and I want that said for the record, just from my own point. Second of all, I am also a little disturbed by uh, the blood center uh, in this move, uh, but I am not uh, surprised by it. It is part of what I have seen over 10 years of the rapacious behavior of the healthcare industry in our community board. This is not, to be very, very clear and precise, this does not uh, deal with the healthcare workers who are toiling away dealing with COVID. I am dealing now with the upper management who have turned, in my humble opinion, after 10 years of watching these hospitals into what appear to be more developers than hospitals. But that may be beside the point, but I just want to make that clear that this seems part of that trend. Um, I'm also disturbed by uh, a continuing issue that I've been bringing up for years, uh, and that is disclosure, that there is an incredible lack of disclosure and public access to information. It is shocking to me how hard it is in this alleged democratic republic that we live in to get information. And I echo 
the wise uh, counsel of Rita Popper, who she and I, like so many, have shared the battle on 74th Street. We've gone to war over these. We've been in the trenches on this. I echo, echo those of you who oppose this to get counsel now. You're already late. You're behind. They have lawyers, hundreds of them, working on this. The other thing I would say is, after learning the battle we fought on 74th Street, that went through. Those who were there, remember, they got the property at a discount. They got the bonds at a discount. And what we found out later that nobody knew why the project was going through was that David Koch was giving hundreds, I think millions of dollars to that project for it to be named. Now that's fine. It's nothing against Mr. Koch, but it's information that would have been relevant to us at the time. Um, Lastly, and on that point, with the commercial tenants, I mean, if they're building this to put in commercial tenants, I don't know if anybody's gotten a memo lately, but commercial uh, space is, uh, there's quite a lot of it available in New York City. So I don't know if building more commercial space is going to work for anybody going forward, because in Midtown, there seems to be a lot of empty office buildings. Lastly, um, just in general, with the blood center, I know everybody seems to love them. My personal experience with them has not necessarily been always so fantastic. So I find uh, some of their tactics on the phone not to be necessarily as friendly as you would expect. Um, and that may be just my experience with them. But I would just say that for the record. But I do oppose this of uh, the way it is configured, the process that's been, that has gone on. The size of it is completely out of context. And the idea that this would set a precedent that will be used throughout the five boroughs, have no doubt. Anybody who says, oh, no, this is a one and done and this will only happen, please give me story B, because that is not working. That's not going to be the case. Anyway, I've gone on very long, um, made the point. Thank you, uh, Anthony and Elizabeth and Elaine and uh, all of my fellow board members. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, Michelle Birnbaum is our next speaker. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Ed, for your kind words. I have a couple of things I'd like to say, starting with, um, with my comments about uh, Elaine's situation. Um, Elaine and I met um, pre my joining the board in um, 2006. When she and I worked together, I was on the executive committee of starting the East 86th Street uh, Association. And uh, Elaine was the president and really uh, maneuvered us through that so that that be did become a prominent association. My association before I knew Elaine preceded that with the Merchant Residence Association on 86th Street. So I go back a very long time with Elaine, but with reference to zoning, she basically taught me most of what I know and what she didn't teach me, she piqued my interest in so that I went forward to find out things for myself. So I very much regret this happening. Um, I know she's gonna be an active member and we are all gonna to continue to work together. And I, um, I wanna welcome Anthony, he's more than capable and uh, have every confidence he'll do a terrific job. And so thank you very much, Anthony. Um, about testimony, I too, as president of Historic Park Avenue, sent down testimony um, to city planning uh, at the time of the scoping session and the thrust of which was about the dangers of being casual about breaching zoning. And that's the point I'll make tonight um, with reference to Marco's comments that if this becomes a C27 um, district, uh, they virtually can do any of the most egregious things that we would consider egregious in a res residential community. So it's not just a matter of supporting or not supporting the uh, development of the blood center site. It's not a matter of their programmatic needs, which are very much in question because since they have not firmed up on the research partnership with the newly joining tenants, we really have no guarantee that they actually will follow through on their stated programmatic needs, whether or not they'll even be able to. So I don't want this to hinge on whether or not uh, we need that kind of research in the area. 
We have a lot of research centers in the area, as you well know, um, with Rockefeller and Memorial and Cornell and all that. So I don't want this to hinge on that. I think we have to focus solely on the zoning, the danger of the casual breach of zoning. As I've said before, zoning is the only thing that keeps this city from absolute chaos. And um, to the members of the community, I had said this before, but there may be different people on this call to please organize, but not only reach out to those of you who live in the immediate area. Because zoning is such a broad issue, because it involves every borough in the city and everyone is threatened by the casual um, you know, disbursement of zoning changes, reach out to others, uh, reach out to people who you know and live and work in other areas of the city and let them write to city planning, eventually to the council uh, about the importance of supporting the zoning resolution as it's written. And this is not to say it could never be changed, but this is to say that if it is changed, it has to be with very, very serious consideration so I urge them to reach out to others and support uh, Rita and others who have encouraged them to organize and make their voices known. With respect to tonight, I hope we're going to hear from them. I would like to hear from them. Uh, they did go forth as a group after our last meetings. I would like to hear from them the point they are. You know, what have they done so mm -hmm. far? What is their organizing so that we can uh, to the extent that we can support them in their efforts. Hard to do that if we don't know, you know, what it is that they're doing. So um, I'd like to uh, rest with that. Thank you all very much. Thank well, you, Michelle. For, uh, I want to flag for the committee chairs that Alita has re-raised her hand. That's not a hand. I see. Alita. Oh, you have to... Where are you hiding, Alita? I'm trying, there was a flag over that. I just wanted to say that I was negligent in not saying how much I valued um, the experience and expertise that Elaine had, which Elizabeth, as Elizabeth, you too did as well in um, all of the time that we worked together when I served as chair. And just to acknowledge Elaine's experience, her expertise, her passion for it. And um, that I know, I mean, it sounds like this is a memorial service, which I know that it isn't, but I know that she will be out there in a different capacity um, do in, in terms of zoning questions and, and zoning perspectives suits. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Max, for doing that. And Elizabeth, for um, asking Max to unmute me. Thank you. Okay. Now, we do have, I think, a member of the public, and, and that would be the last speaker. And then we'll go back to Anthony, who's going to take care of our next item. But uh, Jennifer Ratner. Yes, hi. So uh, just a couple points. I'm speaking here tonight just as a member of the community. Um, and one, I can speak to Elaine because I worked with Elaine on many uh, issues and so uh, wish her well as, as not chair of this committee. And I really respect her opinion on zoning and everyone else's. I came to this tonight because I've been following this issue from the periphery. And I, I was hoping actually that the blood center would present tonight. I thought that's what was happening. But I just wanted to add a little bit of a different perspective. I trained um, briefly as a hematologist at the blood center over 30 years ago. And I wanted to say that is one of the most amazing institutions, not just in our city, but it has national and global reach. And I have no affiliation whatsoever with the blood center except for that training over 30 years ago now. It is an amazing institution in COVID-19. They've developed convalescent plasma. They've developed a vaccine with a, on a national and international level. And so I hope and implore that the community board will work with them to be able to get a new facility. Because what I wanted to say is that when I was a hematology fellow, pediatric hematology fellow over 30 years ago, and I was not very attuned to these kind of things. I remember thinking they need a new facility. They developed cord blood transplant there. They're the pioneers of stem cell transplants. If you get any kind of blood transfusion, not just here, 
but in the entire country, you will be in debt to the blood center. And I remember 30 years ago thinking they need new space. This is the worst space I've ever worked in and look at the miracles that they, they bring about there. So I really hope I, with full, I totally respect all of the zoning concerns and really understand them, but this is a really special place and we are so lucky to have this institution in our neighborhood. And so I hope that we work with them as partners and friends. I have not reached out to them. I'm coming to you totally from the community and wanted to put that out there. Thank you very much. I do want to point out that what the blood center wants from this building is available to them as of right. They do not need to change the zoning or to build a builder, uh, uh, this tower to accommodate what the changes they want, they oh, need told, this. Ex yeah. uh, they need the extra, uh, which is space they will be renting out. So I understand that, but what I do understand, and that I, I I don't think everyone's really brought up, is that the other institutions that have been built have huge donors, donor bases, development offices. The blood center has almost none of that. It's not that kind of institution. It's run by a scientist from what I know. And, and I just don't think, I think we should help them because I can't imagine that they have an option other than what they're trying to do with this. I get it, the big, the building above them that they're not gonna use those floors, but I assume that it's an issue of a lot of money. And that's why they've been working in like literally the entire building is like working in an ancient basement um, and they've needed an upgrade for decades. So that's, uh, so I understand all those issues, but I think we should be working with them as a partner and thanking them. It is an amazing institution and they've, what they've done during COVID is unbelievable. National conferences that I go to on vaccine development reference the blood center, things I didn't even know were going on beyond convalescent plasma, beyond the antibody testing, but vaccine development. I mean, it's unbelievable, actually. Thank you very much. We have several uh, new speakers. Uh, I hope people, because we, uh, Anthony's going to take on um, the uh, proposal for uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, and uh, I, I, I hope we could get to that fairly soon. So I would ask that the people who sp I'll recognize now uh, speak very succinctly. Uh, one, the first is Marco, you're speaking again. Marco Tamayo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, the only thing I'm going to say is nobody, nobody is against the blood center. We support the blood center. Indeed, when I saw the space that in this big development, it has 172,000 square feet for the blood center. And if the blood center doesn't build, doesn't use the, this huge space, they are losing 50,000 square feet. So that means, in other words, if they do as a right of development, doesn't need anything at all. We support that we have a great uh, uh, building for them. Nobody is against that. We support that. But cannot change from community facility to a commercial space. That is the, the bottom line right here. Nobody, please, nobody's against the research that and the blood center that they're doing. By, my, by the way, I, I contribute my blood too over there. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker's name is Kathy. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. So I have two comments, uh, one regarding uh, the board for St. Catherine's Park, which was brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. I am suspicious that the uh, park is probably getting some type of compensation from the blood center group 
in order to support their new adventure, new venture. Um, and my second comment has to do with the blood center needing a new facility. I think we all support the blood center having good facilities, but not the additional commercial space. If the blood center needs funds, if they need money to do that, they probably have several partners, pharmaceutical companies, other types of partners that would be you know, willing to support any type of new facility that does not include the commercial space. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And thanks to everybody who came and shared their views with us. Uh, and this is something that we were obviously going to be following up on. We've taken a position already that we cannot support this. And as you say, we nobody's against the blood center. Everybody's for the blood center. They're just not against. Uh, they're not for this particular proposal. Uh, oh my word! Uh, are we ready to go to? Uh, Anthony, so. are you re you're ready yes. to take on? Yes. I don't want to cut off Elaine Walsh and. Michelle Birnbaum, um, can you uh, have a very quick comment? And first Elaine and then uh, Michelle. And then we go to um, a Anthony, who's going to do uh, the next hill. Thank you, Elizabeth. A number of issues on the blood center. It's really about the zoning. Yes, they've gone with a commercial partner who has no tenants at this point, which is of interest. But we already now have Rockefeller University has been approved as a health science center and has identified partners, MSK and Cornell Weill. The blood center has not, nor has Longfellow. We do not need two health sciences in our community. The Blood Center talked about economic development and talked about all these people who could get jobs. There are many sites in other communities, including 125th and 3rd, and they have all rejected this. But there is no reason we cannot share the wealth about what needs to be done in health sciences by working with our own or our other community boards. I am very upset to hear that one, the Rockefeller Center was moving forward and we did not know about it, but that the blood center has not responded. They did not come tonight because they're too busy with their scoping. It is unacceptable. We need them to come to the community. We can work with them, but we have, the city has identified at least three sites. It's interesting, Rockefeller got 9 million through the health sciences program the city is running, the blood center never applied. So I think it's a zoning issue, but I think more it's an economic diversity issue and we need to understand where they're coming from and why Longfellow is so important that they think they need to meet with them. Elizabeth, you're right. It's an as of right, they can do a the five story, it'll be under 75 feet and they got more space than they need. So whatever their lack of fundraising is, that's not our issue. The chair of the board for the law firm that is representing the blood site, the blood center, I'm sorry, I always call it the blood site, is highly powered. It's, it's a law firm, Levin and Kravit. Kramer. The I'm sorry, I can never, you know, I'm not. Kramer correct. 11. Thank you, Kramer 11. Now everybody, so you can look it up. Is the law firm representing them? And he is also the chair of the board of the blood center. I would hope that that board can identify donors to help rebuild within the as of right on 66th and 67th Street. Thank you. 
Thanks, Elaine. And a couple of words from Michelle. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. I just wanted to say uh, St. Catherine's Park has been raised a few times, both, both at our last meeting and now tonight. And it's interesting to me also that they've never come. You know, they are an interested party and the surrounding buildings mm -hmm. have come and it's just interesting that they haven't come. So I wonder if this committee would agree to offer um, you know, an invitation to them specifically, the board of St. Patrick, uh, St. Catharines, and yes. ask them to please come to our next meeting so that we can hear from them as to their point of view and interest. Yes, I, I well, I, I'm not to speak yeah. for Elizabeth as well, but I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yes, good. I think that would be yeah. a really good idea. And then we can also address our concerns directly yes. to them. But more importantly, I would like to hear from them. They should have a lot of interest in this subject. Because we've heard from the other- Surrounding people. Neighbors, right. Exactly. Yeah, we heard, heard from the school. The... Yeah, and all the neighbors. And it's a big gap- the neighbors. Not to have yeah. heard from them. Uh, there was one uh, member of the board, of their board, who spoke and testified at the scoping session. It was a bit of a roundabout testimony. I don't know if it was a formal position that the whole St. Catherine's board is taking, but that's precisely the questions that I think we need to ask. So I would like very much for them to come and terrific if you could arrange it, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one speaker, Anthony, but- that's Please go ahead. Let him, Do you think let him we should go and ahead and stuff. listen yeah, to him? So. Okay. Um, Marty Bell, and we'd be very grateful if you were brief. I'm, I'm very sorry, but. Uh, Th thank you for recognizing me, recognizing me, and I will be very brief. First, with respect to Rockefeller University, which Marco raised, they are, according to the patch article, converting other space to these uh, li uh, life science labs which shows that it can be done for that other real estate that's just plenty of vacant space in the city. Secondly, the very architect who is the who appeared before this first committee meeting on behalf of the Blood Center was quoted in a New York Times article saying it's much quicker for um, conversion of existing space than to building new space. And in that same article where they were talking about health, health uh, life science space in the city, it says it's a mini, it's a mini boom. And we, we can Google it and see there are five or six other sites like this in the city, whereas the blood center won't be ready until according to their own best estimates, 2026. So if there's a mini boom and, and life science is gone, then the concerns that Marco raised about this zoning opening up the space for anything else is real a real concern. The second thing I would just like to say is that with um, respect to the, uh, the Jennifer who talked about the blood center and maybe they need this, if you look at the blood center tax filings which are available, they have $270 million in hand in cash and public traded securities, an additional $35 million in hedge funds they pay their president $1.8 million, which I think is double what the Red Cross president makes, which does much more blood work around the country. They've spent almost $100 million, according to their tax filings, acquiring other blood centers around and supporting other blood centers around the country. So in terms of, they certainly seem to have the money here. In fact, the president who makes 1.8 million, that's 50% more than the president of Rockefeller University, which if it was a standalone country would have the third largest number of Nobel laureates in the world. So, I mean, I'm not worried that they could, if they wanted to just build what they need in their existing uh, zoning. One other thing, the gentleman who spoke about the BSL-3 lab, uh, I'm involved in connection with the um, COVID research at the Mayo Clinic. And when we do um, work with the actual virus, virus, it's in a BSL-3 lab. And as everyone knows, COVID is very contagious. So having a BSL-3 lab 
does not mean they won't be using viruses that are very contagious. Lastly, let me say that I, although I'm only new to attending uh, meetings of the zoning committee, I echo and share everyone else's uh, uh, disappointment with uh, Elaine, Elaine Walsh's removal. I've just been amazingly impressed and just so happy that she's been with you, Elizabeth, sharing this. And I'm just thankful that she's going to continue being an active member. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you very much. And now over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, a, a couple of almost random thoughts on the blood center. Um, first, I do not believe it is the community's responsibility to figure out ways for applicants to fund their projects. Um, and so I think that the um, uh, uh, blood center, the blood center's commercial space, which will amount to about um, two thirds to three quarters of the actual lab space built as commercial space, is in fact, I mean, it, it's their problem. And it might be one thing to have a BSL-3 lab in a residential neighborhood, but not 400,000 square feet of BSL-3 labs. And I think that um, as, as well designed and as well built as it may be, accidents happen. And this is an accident that would allow um, airborne pathogens into a residential neighborhood. Um, so with that, um, almost three years ago, the um, uh, Northwell Lenox Hill made a presentation to this committee. It was in March of uh, 2019. Uh, yeah, two years ago. And at that time, they showed us what they wanted to do. And um, then they made another presentation, I think in November of that year. And there was a, um, uh, a task force uh, on the part of the Manhattan Borough President to um, discuss the issues brought out by that, um, um, I think, enormous proposal. Uh, the complete rebuilding of Lenox Hill Hospital over the course of 10 years. Um, at the conclusion of the task force, this is just bringing everybody sort of up to date, um, the um, Northwell Lenox Hill conceded that their uh, residential tower, 505 feet tall on Park Avenue, uh, would not be built. And instead, uh, they would continue to build slightly smaller admittedly, but a 465 foot tower on um, Lexington Avenue that occupied the virtually the entire block front and to a depth of almost 200 feet into um, the uh, mid block. Now, um, there are zoning issues. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, applicants are going to be asking for a large number of zoning variances uh, in order that they might um, build this. Uh, we don't know exactly what they're asking for yet. Um, they claim to not be at a point where they can discuss that with us and once again declined um, uh, to appear here and show us what they're doing. Um, so, uh, with that said, it would be useful um, to, uh, at this point, hear from the community. I see we have Valerie's hand Valerie. up. Valerie, okay. Oh, she's Valerie. waving. She's waving herself off? No. Ah, okay. Now we, well, all right. So we're starting to get community, uh, uh, members of the public. Uh, so perhaps Valerie can wait a moment. Uh, we'll start with Linda Cornelius. If you can unmute her and find her. I did. Uh, Linda, you just have to click uh, unmute. Got it. There you, there you go. go. 
Hi, I'm, um, I'm representing the East 77th Street Block Association. I also serve on the board of the building at 205 East 77th Street. Uh, I also served on the task force that was put together by the Manhattan Borough President. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while the focus of that uh, task force was really what was happening on Park and on Lexington Avenues, there was really no attention paid to the development that's planned for Third Avenue. So I wanted to at least uh, address that. Mm -hmm. um, here's what we know. We know that it's going to be an ambulatory care center. It won't have any emergency services. Uh, it is going to be as of right, which is about 200,000 square feet from what I understand, 12 to 14 stories within the current zoning. Uh, there will be no parking in the building. Uh, the construction we've heard uh, is to begin late this year and last about three years. And they've said that some form of retail would be planned at the street level. So um, here, however, is what we don't know and what the community uh, is concerned about. Timing. Is it still on schedule uh, to begin this year? If so, they must have plans and designs. Uh, what is it going to look like? Will it fit into the neighborhood? Will the building be scaled with setbacks or not? And what is the shadow effect on neighboring buildings and terraces? Housing Works is still standing. We've heard that there is some structural issue with the adjoining building, 204 East 77th. Will the Housing Works structure remain? What is, are the air quality and noise impacts of a three-year construction period? This is a very dense residential area with two schools in close proximity. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what is the latest thinking on uh, retail uh, or neighborhood services at the street level, given what we're seeing happening with retail and the vacancies at the street level? So those are a bunch of questions that we have. Uh, Lenox Hill has told me that they are open to a meeting with the community. And so I would really call upon um, Keith Powers' office uh, to help us set that up. Uh, Lenox Hill said they would, they would work with his office to set up some kind of a community Zoom for us to be updated on what's happening on Third Avenue because that, unlike what's happening on Lexington and Park, is imminent. Uh, I would just like to say uh, a thank you uh, to Elaine uh, for everything she has done for the community. It's been uh, just a real treat for me to get to know her. And I look forward to her continued advocacy on all of our behalf. Thank you, Linda. Um, it, I, I think all of this follows through with the same issues of um, lack of transparency on the part of um, on the part of Northwell and an unwillingness on the part of Northwell to actually engage either this committee or the or the the the, the neighboring community. I mean, I live two blocks away. Um, this is uh, um, before the Second Avenue subway. I walk past it every day to go to work, and it is. Um, it's essential we know more about the building. And okay, it's fine to say there's no parking. Now I'm gonna get wound up, but it's, it's fine to say that there's no parking. It's except um, ambulatory care facilities that don't have parking means that there will be an in, unbelievable glut of cars stopping to drop people off, pick people up, and it's not like if it's an ambulatory care facility, it's not like these the patients are able to dash out of the uh, hospital and leap into their cars as they just slow down rather than stopping. And I think that those issues, which are larger traffic issues and neighborhood traffic issues, especially since that's the sort of uptown bus lane on top of everything else, um, are, are, are things we need to know about. Are they planning a big sort of uh, um, uh, a port cochere where you sort of drive in and drive out? 
more traffic problems. What is the, what's the real idea? It would be almost better if they said they wanted to um, uh, put it to some other purpose like um, doctor's residences. Um, at least at least we can understand another apartment house. But anyway, I, I, I'm starting to go on. Uh, and uh, so with that, I'll call on Jordan Woke. Speaking of ambulatory care facilities, unfortunately, I happen to go to MSK, 74th Street and the East River. And that is a horror of vehicles. Um, it's a cul-de-sac. Um, cars mm -hmm. are parked by their valet service on um, the north side of the street, double parked. The cars on the south side, cars all over. Um, it, it, the thought that there is, and there is some parking available, the thought that there'll be no parking for the Lenox Hill facility makes absolutely no sense. It's not on a cul-de-sac. One can hardly imagine the horror. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein. Go ahead, Betty, it starts with okay. Am I on? You are. Hello? Okay. Yes, you are. Anthony, um, I haven't met you, but I thank you very much. Uh, I certainly agree with the comment you made that the community um, does not have to be alone in figuring out how to fight the blood center. Uh, I think that uh, the fact that they didn't, I mean, apparently there were only three of us who spoke in the public with regard to the blood center, so people did not come. They didn't show up. And I'm also concerned, uh, Anthony, because I know how hard many of you have been working, that it's wonderful that um, that Northwell, you know, that the hospital also wants to meet with the community. That's very good. But they didn't show up or even call to say they weren't showing up last time. And I, I don't know how many people from the community are there tonight. So I think that we have to look and see what more the community board and, and our committees can do. Um, I think it's, we you know, when we have 100 or more people coming and then when the meeting is called a second time and people yeah. don't show up, something has to be looked at to see what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. It looks as though we are now into board members. Um, and uh, Gail Barron is first up. Actually, uh, Anthony, if I can just interject for a quick second. Um, I got a message from someone from the public that said they would like to speak. I see you're waving your hand. Um, oh, okay. Go to Evelyn. Go ahead, Evelyn. Yes, thank you very much. I'm not sure if you can, I think oh, I'm yes. unmuted. Yeah, no, thank you. Yes, and I, I just I just want to note, and I, Linda, I'm I'm fascinated to hear that the hospital wants to meet with the community about Third Avenue because, you know, as we've discussed, the task force meetings have ended. They ended almost three months ago, and we have not heard a further peep about the hospital engaging uh, with the community. Instead, they have taken their battle to the media. There have been a number of articles in the Patch and in the Daily News that in, in my view are quite favorable to the hospital. And so they've turned this into a public relations war instead of a uh, community engagement uh, discussion, um, which I guess is not surprising, but it is disappointing. And so uh, I, I think it's incumbent on the community. And I see uh, that we have representatives of our elected offices here tonight, which is terrific, um, but we really do need their help. and. Uh, Keith Powers, who has obviously been an incredible, uh, you know, has put a tremendous amount of time and effort um, and, and, and Borough President Brewer have been phenomenal through this process. But the fact that they have not taken a clear position, and in fact, even in the Daily News article yesterday, Council Member Powers continues to try to appease the hospital, in my view, and appease both sides, and we've gotten nowhere. We really need a firm commitment from our electeds to stand up for the community 
and put an end to this. As, as Anthony, as you point out, this is now two years of discussion. And the uh, hospital claimed during part of this process to be listening to the community. Their actions speak louder than words. They have not, they show utter contempt for the community. And it's, it's, it's just going on and on and we're getting nowhere. So I, I plea with our elected officials to step in now and actually represent the community in a in a truly uh, necessary manner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now Gail, unmute her. I had. There we go. Evelyn, I just want to let you know I completely agree with you. No matter what the hospital has said in wanting to work with the community. They have been absolutely disingenuous. Those of us that served on the Northwell Task Force found that they kept rediscussing what their programmatic needs are. And this brings me to Elaine. Of all of the task force members, Elaine never lost sight of one thing. This is a zoning issue. And she kept beating them on the head with that. They kept kind of figuring out ways to work around it. And I know that so many people have said, we have to work with the blood center. We have to work with Northwell and with others that are threatening overdevelopment. And I think the community board has shown that we're more than willing to do so. But you reach that point where we really need the help of our elected officials because Northwell has not only not been willing to work with us, they have been arrogant and they've looked at every issue that we have raised and they've dismissed it. And I agree they're doing a public relations war against what the community wants. And so the community has to continue to be vigilant, both in opposing the blood center and opposing uh, the Northwell development as it still stands. I think because of the community involvement, at least the, uh, the condo tower was eliminated, but a 400 foot Hospital tower is not acceptable on Lexington with a 170 foot height limit. So I think we all have to be vigilant. And I, for one, am so sad that Elaine is not able to continue as a co-chair of the committee. And I love Elizabeth and I love Anthony, but thank you, Elaine, for your graciousness in being willing to continue to remain as an active member of the committee. Okay. Oh, and Ed, who is applauding, has his uh, also has his hand up. Thank you, Anthony. And I would like to uh, echo the previous speaker, uh, Evelyn. I, I agree with you. And Gail, um, I am reminded listening to Anthony talking about ambulatory care centers. You sound like me ten years ago when MSK came to this board. Um, I believe it was uh, 2012 for 1130 York Avenue. Those of you who remember that. Um, and I, yeah, I see Michelle, you nodding. And I remember I had, that was the first time I spoke at a meeting and we had almost, remember that at the Ramaz school, we had almost 200 people, it was wall to wall. And I had the temerity to raise the issue that you did, Anthony, which is what about traffic on York Avenue? Of which everybody said, you soon will find yourself not on community board aid if you say one word about anything that any hospital is doing on York Avenue. And let's be abundantly clear. I co-chair the housing committee. I think any of the developers who come and have spoken to us over the last six years understand if you're willing to show respect to us, it is a mutually respectful situation for us. We are happy to dialogue with you, but we do not like it. And I have to say, it's not surprising that when people are told uh, to quote uh, someone from an old uh, sitcom, Alice, to kiss their grits all the time, that, you know, it's not going to uh, be a lot of good dialogue. Um, the other thing is, on the 1130 project and the traffic, that, and speaking of disingenuousness, I remember part of that particular project involved a lot of ripping up of York Avenue with the initial building of that building which is we all remember used to be a gas station. It was across from the mobiles, the gas station, the whole zoning thing. And after they built that ambulatory care center, I believe it is that they built on 61st Street in York, there was no 
traffic, there was no work on the street, which always sort of surprised me. But I take my son to hockey practice and we go down York Avenue to avoid the second Avenue bottleneck to get on the bridge. So I'm very familiar with what's going on on York Avenue. And I don't know if MSK just put that work off but there has been an inordinate amount of work on York Avenue. I mean, it's horrendous out there. Now, again, I don't know uh, how that works. I, these folks have a lot of influence, again, begging our elected officials to step in here. Uh, we are just advisory. Again, we have no a power, a, a power. All these members of the board know this. We have no ability to stop anything. Well, so I just leave that it out. Good. I just wanted to- that good? Um, Sorry. I just wanted to uh, point that out and uh, echo uh, Evelyn's point. And Evelyn, be ready, because after I spoke out about MSK, and again, not to say anti-hospital, okay, that particular, in that particular instance, the issue was the lot lines, the lot lines on that one. They refused to pare back their building, and they cast 54 apartments in total darkness forever because of the way they built that building. There would no be no sunlight what in that atrium. Now, the point of why I go on about this is not only did it have a negative impact economically on 54 people who had bought their apartment, and we all know in New York City, if you don't have light in your apartment, it will have a deleterious effect on its resale value. But not only did they not care about that, but I, I will just give you a little something, Evelyn, if you're out there and you've spoken out about this, be ready for being met on the street by people who will tell you that you're pro-death. You're anti-hospital because you want to have a dialogue, you're pro-death. And, and, and they're like, oh, Ed, that's so hyperbolic. That's truth. I had at least five people during that time come up to me on the street, saw me at a community board meeting and said, oh, I remember you. You're the pro-death guy. That is not the point here, Gay. No one's pro-death, no one's anti-hospital. We're pro-dialogue, pro-community, pro-working together. And I just wanted to point that out. I'm disturbed by what I hear. It seems to be an ongoing thing. For those who are running for office out there, um, you know, elected officials, hello, w where are we? So um, I think the community is speaking loud and clear and I'll stop, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just received a message from Valerie. Um, her waving off earlier is now revoked and, and she is very interested in speaking. Oh, all right. Um, okay, so we'll take <laughs> Valerie next. Jeez, wow, with that introduction. Listen, I, I, I'm gonna echo a little bit of what's been said. I mean, I, I think the words of Rita about organization on all of these points but I have to tell you, as somebody who participated in a fight against city agencies uh, in another project, um, I think it's really unfair, unfair that the community has to go out and spend money to protect a law that is already in favor of the community that has already been enacted. And to, to sort of uh, reiterate on points that were made by other members of our board, and, where are our elected officials? I think we should ask the mayor of the city of New York to come to our next meeting and explain to us why he has come out in favor of this project without consulting with any of us. I think we should write letters to every member of the board of trustees of the New York Blood Center. And if you wanna include Lenox Hill Hospital in that, to let them know that this community is outraged by their lack of neighborliness. To echo Ed's point, these hospitals and these groups are in our neighborhood and they should start acting like our neighbors. We support them in a lot of their endeavors and they do not act like neighbors. They do not come to our community boards unless to use, I mean, if the, unless they're subpoenaed and even then they don't show up, but they want us to, to think of them in a positive view and they never participate. They never want to get involved in anything. And it's just unfortunate that we have to be their neighbor, but they don't seem to want to be our neighbors. You know, just look at this COVID crisis. Where are all these hospitals? What have they provided to us? They keep talking about they want expansion of their facilities and they're going to help the community with, with wellness programs and this and that. 
a meeting room, that's your neighborliness. You take all of the seats on our buses so our elderly residents can't get on and use them. And then when I call up to say, hey, will you come and support us to ask for more bus service? They say, oh, that's not our problem. We got bigger fish to fry. We can't alienate the elected officials. We need them for our projects. Well, let them participate in this neighborhood. Let them be valued members of our community. Everything is always a fight and we have to pay for it. And that's not right. We have, we're gonna do it, we're gonna organize and we're gonna do the best we can with the information we have as late as it is. And people are mobilizing, yeah, maybe it's too late, but you shouldn't have to fight against your neighbors. They should be in this with us and we need to have them participate. And if they don't wanna participate, well then maybe they're not our neighbors anymore and we have to view them differently. Because you're right, Ed, this is only advisory. And we, they are making us being adversaries instead of neighbors. And that is not the way to participate in a community, especially in a community that is under siege. They own almost every building on every block and they, they're not transparent about it. And we have to be more active and we need to have these elective officials respond to us. And I agree, everyone who's running you better get ready to run for this community because that's what we're going to expect. And which neighbor are you going to represent when you're sitting in all these different offices? Are you going to represent everyone who lives in an apartment building or the board of directors of the New York Blood Center? And I put that out there for everybody. Everybody start writing letters to these people and let them know what it's like to be a member of the community. I'm done. Thank oh, you, except Valerie. to say, Elaine, <laughs> <laughs> you taught me the ABCs of zoning. I know you're not going anywhere and there's nothing that precludes you becoming a chair in the future of this committee. And I look forward to that. Uh, Alita uh, is next. Um, yes. Thank you. I, I wanna say in terms of the PR blitz that both the blood center and the hospital and they are both represented by the same lobbyist, Kasira, have gone to to have taken to referring to the height in stories, thinking that the public um, equates a story with 10 feet, when in reality, a story at the blood center is 20 feet. So when they say it's 16 stories, the community is probably thinking, oh, 160 feet, 16 floors, like in a residential building, not so bad. When it's 320 feet, I saw in the Daily News article that it's the same thing. They talked about a 26 story building, but the hospital has said to the extent that it's actually spoken with us, that the floor to ceiling in the, uh, in the new patient rooms are 16 feet tall um, as opposed to 13 in the old ones. So that is, I think, an underhanded way of making it look like the public, uh, making it look like they're not so bad and they're not so intrusive and uh, certainly underselling what they're actually doing. I agree more than 100% with everything that Valerie has said and everything that Gal has said. Unfortunately, it feels right now, and I think it's because the administration tends to agree with applicants, that the applicant has the benefit of the doubt and the community is always trying to be defensive and trying to defend and to recommend that the and urge the city to be in support of the community that has these rules in place. The zoning rules enacted after much difficulty, especially the mid-block zoning that applies to both Lenox Hill and the Blood Center. It took a lot of effort to get those rules enacted. And now we're having to defend them against intrusion and disruption um, and the tearing apart by these entities. It's, it's wrong that we have to be in a defensive position that when the applicant comes, it seems to assume that because it's a not-for-profit and working in the public interest that it gets to do whatever it wants. And unfortunately, this administration seems to think that that is perfectly fine, leaving us in a very difficult position of having to spend money, gather up resources and fight these things. They should be having to be in the position of 
urging us to support their position, not the other way around. They should be trying to persuade the elected officials that what they want makes sense, not just assuming that they get it. And it feels that they are just assuming that they get it. The other thing I heard about the blood center, and I, I know we're really talking about Northwell at this point, is that the reason they don't have money to do this themselves is because they have spent their money acquiring other blood centers, either locally or around the country, leaving them with few financial resources to construct the building. That should not put the burden on the neighborhood. It should not require us to accept this kind of tower, a for-profit tower, when we don't know what they're renting it for. And in any event, there's no reason ever to have that size and scale and bulk of building in the mid block. So there are, and the hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, and the blood center both. And again, I don't know if it's Casira or I don't know if it's the entities themselves, but they have both refused to engage with us. After months of task force meetings with the hospital, they expanded the size of the medical tower by 70 or 80,000 feet without any explanation. Yes, they took some height off, they moved it horizontally, they expanded the size of it. 70 or 80,000 square feet is a lot. We don't know why they did that. Um, and they have not talked to us about it. There has been no consultation on Third Avenue, which has gone through three variations from a statement that they don't know what it, it, they're going to do with it to it's going to be a cancer center to it's going to be outpatient. I think that's their latest thing that they've said. So there is no interest in engaging with us. There is no interest from the blood center in engaging with us. I do think um, that together we could come up with something that would make sense that would allow the hospital to modernize and would also respect the needs and interests of the community, but they have not shown any willingness to do so. They have been, as Gal said, they've been arrogant, they've been dismissive, they have not, even though um, people with great credentials have been hired to, uh, to uh, discuss and study their, their proposal, every aspect of their proposal, they've treated these experts with multiple graduate degrees, including medical degrees, as a, as a fly in the ointment without much regard and respect. And the whole process has been um, disheartening and frustrating and very, very difficult because they've refused to acknowledge the significant and overwhelming impact of either of these buildings on the neighborhood. So I'm done with that. I just wanted to let you know to beware when you see these articles by um, by their public that their publicists have inserted into newspapers to read them very, very skeptically because everything in there is designed to turn the public tide of opinion in their favor. So thank you. Thank you, Alita. Um, Elaine. Whoops, have we lost her? No, she's right here, but. Elaine, right. if you're there, uh, just click on mute. Oh, there she is. Okay, I'm sorry, my battery was going down, so I almost got cut off. Um, let me say I've agreed with everything that everybody said, but I have to tell you, Northwell promised when the task force meetings ended, they would mm -hmm. meet with them. It took our committee over 10 months to get them to come to the first meeting last year. They don't show up, they don't communicate. Their la latest reason for not coming tonight was they're busy with COVID. I'm sure there must be someone, including their lobbyists that could attend. And I noticed they're not even here tonight. They have been disrespectful. They have not owned up to anything. They think it's as of right. There are all kinds of undercurrents out there that Michael Dowling and the governor are close, but we cannot allow that to happen. We need the community to stand up, to reach out to all the electeds, not only in our community board, but if you have connections in other community boards, this is so important. There should be no reason that given the resources we have with a range of different hospitals, that we cannot share the wealth with other communities. I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm of the age that I'm eligible for a vaccine. And I have gone on, as everybody else has, not success, although last week I did get my shot, first shot, not here in our neighborhood. But 
I kept trying Lenox Hill, trying Lenox Hill, and I kept saying there were vacancies, okay? I walked over there and the staff said, oh, our website doesn't work, there's a glitch. So indeed, in a recent email to the lobbyists who had promised they were notified in early December about this date to come, I said, by the way, if they're so busy with the COVID, at least fix your glitch in your website. Now I see the website is down. I think that was probably one of the reasons why some people weren't happy with my directness. But if we can't, as community members, talk to our institutions and ask to work together and be responsible, then I don't know why institutions should get whatever they want when they ignore our community. I think Valerie, what you said was so on target, but Northwell has been unresponsive. The blood center, unresponsive. Neither one today, they would be here. They said, oh, we're too busy with scoping. Do they know we're all volunteers on the community board? And we've set aside time to listen and work with them. No, uh, it's already been said, they've all got, both of them have the same lobbying firm, the same architect, et cetera. I'm really concerned as a native born Manhattanite, born and raised on 86th and born at Lenox Hill, that we are losing our community to money, power, and institutions that don't have a commitment. Longfellow, as part of the blood center, is an investment firm. Lenox Hill, Northwell, is growing themselves as a leader in healthcare. They tell us they're, they're number one, whatever, whatever. We don't care about that. We care about them being a health partner in a local community, but we want to share that wealth. So I think there are other parts of our city, if not our suburbs, that could use some medical help. And I'd like to see us work with Northwell to redesign and redeploy assets here to either other parts of Manhattan. I understand the lower part of Manhattan needs help and work together and not be seen as, and I've been told this, oh, that wealthy community does not want the institutions. It has nothing to do with wealth. We look at the board members of these hospitals, look at their wealth. I grew up here in a tenement. Don't tell us there's not two societies here in our neighborhood. And I ask Lennox Hill, and I ask our electeds to work with us to make sure we have good health care here, but that we share it and we do not violate our zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we have Rita next. There she is. Ed Hartog and I, who work very closely with the people uh, against MSK. The people who lived around there came with photographs at different times of the day showing traffic at the intersection of 72nd Street and York Avenue, what goes on? So now that Ed says it's even worse with MSK or um, Jordan Wilkes said, it's even worse with MSK open. They were the ones who said traffic is not a problem. Absolutely not a problem. So let's unpeel this onion. Let's take some layers out. Why do people like Northwell? Why do people like, I don't even know the, the name of the company for the blood center. They come here against our zoning regulations, which Anthony has assured me 
is not a suggestion, but is it really something that you, it's concrete. Yes. What assures them that they are going to get it passed? Not the community board, because the people don't, believe, don't matter. The residents don't matter. They're going to do what they want. Why are they assured that it's going to pass and I'm asking the question because I don't know the answer. Is it the C city planning commission? If it is a sitting planning commission, who appoints the people who sit on the city planning commission? That's who is running the show. That's my two cents. I, they know, they know, these developers know that they're going to they're going to try to bring it in, and they know they're going to be treated well by the people who have final decisions. That's just an opinion. Thank you, Rita, um, and one I think we share. Um, I have uh, Marco next, and then Michelle and Billy. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me, uh, Anthony? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Um, I believe in a reasonable development. I call it sometimes harmonious development. And I'm not going to repeat everything that everybody has been saying, because that is harmonious development. But I'm going to give you one simple example. One day, I was taking the train number six. And everybody was pushing to get access. At the same time, one council member came and he was seen and he was unable to have access. That is not a reasonable development. And that is a good example of what we are talking right here. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Michelle. Yes, thank you. Okay. I just wanted to mention that when we had our charter commission, um, committee when they were we were writing the uh you know the new charter commission for new, the new charter for new york uh one of the things that we asked for unfortunately it didn't get enacted we asked for some input into um as of right development in other words just because development was as of right in accordance with the zoning and I abide by the zoning. I think, as I've been saying all along, we have to respect the zoning. But that doesn't mean that the community can't have some comments on what is being built or offer some suggestion to the developers with the full recognition and acknowledgement that it's an as of right development. And we can actually applaud the fact that it's an as of right development. I would like to invite the Blood Center um, letting them know that we fully acknowledge that it is an as of right development, that we have no intention of un undermining what they have to do. But we do think that as community uh, representatives and because community members attend our open meetings, we do think that we have some insight despite all of the research that they do. This is not to say they don't do their research, they don't do their demographics, they do all that. But we have some insight that could be very valuable and we would like to just offer to them some concerns that we have and ask them to please address it, address them, even though we recognize that they do not have to by law as a courtesy, and because we want to think of them as neighbors in the community, can they please come and listen to some of our concerns? But I do want, if such an invite is put forth, I would like it to be preceded by the fact, recognized to them, acknowledged to them that we understand it's an as of right building, so that we don't want the response from them to say, well, it's an as of right building. <laughs> we, we understand that. So I would like to have them come. Um, also, it's a very good time to address a law that was passed by city planning <clears throat> about five years ago that unfortunately this board supported, and that was removing the requirement for indoor parking when buildings are built 
you know, larger than a certain amount of square footage or whatever it was. I'm proud to say I voted against that. I think the vote in favor of it came for all, from all those who would like to see, you know, cars and vehicles eliminated from uh, Manhattan. Hopefully we can now all recognize that that will not happen. It's still a free country. If people want to own a car, they can own a car. Most of business is conducted on four wheels in this, in this city. And uh, especially it was interesting in the time of COVID, the purchase of individual automobiles went way up because people didn't want to use public transportation. And so they were using more individual automobiles without dissecting all the reasons and everybody's particular philosophy on automobiles, suffice it to say, I think it's a good time to address the need for putting indoor parking into development of certain size. And maybe this board would like to consider it. Um, I'm sure it's main would be considered mainly in the transportation committee, but because it was passed by city planning, I think that would be a good joint with the zoning committee. I don't think it's out of the realm of the zoning committee. So I offer those two suggestions. One, to invite Northwell to specifically discuss the Third Avenue site, and two, to try to get something uh, with a joint committee on uh, the indoor parking situation. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michelle, very, uh, very quickly. Um, yes, I think it's worth taking up the, in, uh, the uh, indoor parking issue. I've never understood why, um, uh, why it was abandoned. No, forbidden maybe is a better, um, uh, a better way to describe it. But you were referring not to the blood center, but to Northwell. Um, the Lennox Hill Third Avenue. Correct, side. Northwell. Okay, fine. To I just wanted to, I wanted, no, just wanted to make sure. No, specifically for them, for them to come because that site is an as of right yes. site. So it's Northwell. That's what, and with the full recognition that we acknowledge that it's as of right, but we they're neighbors and we'd like to welcome them. Yes, we, uh, I believe we will make our invitations uh, uh, in that way, I believe. Good, um, thank you. And, no, thank you. And uh, next, uh, we have Billy who has joined us. Billy, if you unmute him, thanks. Yep. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, you know, apologies. I was watching a little bit on YouTube while I while I could. I heard some of the comments earlier. I know a lot of the ground has already been covered. I just wanted to say something about the Blood Center and Northwell, and and a couple of things I see in common that I really want us to focus on. Um, you know, one is that in both cases we're talking about zoning for dollars. We're talking about using the zoning resolution to get a change in zoning in order to effectively lease out uh, space, whether it's to build up uh, residential luxury high rise or to lease to commercial tenants. You know, that's using the zoning code to make a profit. That's using, using the zoning code to get subsidy. I would call that corporate welfare. And that bothers me. I think that should bother anyone in the city. And, and even if you found any one of these particular proposals to be meritorious, you should still be concerned about the larger principle and how it's going to be used and abused. So I want to tie it back to what Michelle said earlier tonight, if I'm remembering correctly, because this is what I was watching again on YouTube. And Michelle was saying, you know, we need to make sure that people realize this is not just about the Upper East Side, right? This is about zoning in our entire city. And so I think point one is zoning for dollars. And point two is process. I think everyone here feels relatively disrespected by the fact that, you know, Northwell doesn't have a representative. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the Blood Center sent a representative no, tonight. They did not. You know, I mean, what are we doing here? It's a slap in the face. And if you believe in any role for community in these decisions, you need to at least respect us by showing up. I mean, that's sort of a start. And so, you know, again, it's not about the Upper East Side, it's about process. And this could happen in any neighborhood around the city. Are you going to show up and engage with communities in good faith or not? So I know a lot's already been said, and I hate being repetitive, but I wanted to, you know, share what you know, I was thinking, and I think maybe that can form the basis of going forward. How do we get more people citywide, borough-wide interested in this topic? Those are a couple uh, problems I think could be escalated a little bit more. Thanks. Thank you, Billy. Um, so we don't get, uh, let's see. Oops, somebody turned something off. All right. So we have Elaine, Rita, Betty Cooper, Wallerstein, and then we might want to move on unless someone has something that's driving them crazy. Um, so, uh, Elaine. 
Yes, I, I think I spoke already, so I don't know. Yeah, how you that... did. Well, I'll give you another chance if you need it. Well, you know, all I want to say is I agree with everybody, and I think this is really a zoning issue. And the institutions think they have the influence, not only with politicians, but with dollars and their wealthy donors to do whatever they want to do. So it's sad, but none of what they're doing is as of right, other than the Third Avenue mystery story. And uh, we cannot, if the blood center should get approved, it would impact RAP zoning within the city, which yep. means zoning doesn't count anymore. So that's our concern. It's a precedent. But more, more important, they don't need Longfellow. And there's another issue that's going to come up where we have another real estate investor. All they're doing is trying to make money. They're not interested in our community. So I hope we just focus on the zoning and fight and get our electeds and all the city council members not to let this go through. And that's the key. We no. have to have the city council on this part. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Rita? Now you need to unmute. I have a question. We have an, a building that is not as of right. So now where, and we are challenging that, that building. Where does that building then go to get permission to build what they want and not what the community wants? Who gives them that permission? Well, ultimately it's the city council and the mayor. Uh, and the board of standards and appeals. And the board of standards, yes, thank you, Elizabeth. And, and who, who appoints the people who sit on the board of standards and appeals? Mayor. The mayor. The mayor, yeah. Ah, uh, and he has a majority <laughs> of the people who sit on that board. Is that correct? So basically, I'm peeling away the, the onion, as Elaine taught me how to do it, but I think it was with a different thing, with chocolate cake. But at any rate, so does it come down to the mayor? Are we seeing that this mayor is term limited, that he is leaving office, that he needs a job, that suddenly all of these things are coming almost to the end of where he has some control over it. I'm only asking a question because I think that's where the problem is. You could visit me in Thank <laughs> Thank you, Rita. I will. Um, I think we now, uh, Betty Cooper Wallerstein was, want, was wanted to speak again and, um, and then Marco, and then I think we should move on. Um, sure. Betty, I've unmuted uh, you. Anthony, so. I don't want to uh, interrupt everything, but ju just simply to point out that the Board of Standards and Appeals is appealable. And we have won cases in the courts. You bring what's called an Article 78 action. And uh, they don't have discretion to do whatever they choose. They're subject to uh, review by the court. OK, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. OK, I did unmute. You are unmuted. Am I? Yes. OK. Thank you so much. Um, I certainly agree with Valerie and the others who said that it's time for our elected officials to give the support that we are asking for and need. But I do want to say also that the reason that these places are not coming back to us and the people don't show up tonight when you have these both on the record is because they don't have the support of the full board and that you know that there are board members who are supporting them, and those are the ones they're going to. So the board has to look at what's happening within its own board. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, okay. Um, just um, sort of as we move on, um, there are uh, just wanted to point out that there is a representative from Assembly Member C. Wright's office. Somebody pointed these out to me. Um, Councilman uh, Councilman Powers' office and um, the Manhattan Borough President's office, so that um, at, at least there is someone, there are some electeds listening to us, or at least hearing us. Um, there's one item that we'll call old business, uh, which isn't really old for this committee, uh, and that's the 91st Street um, uh, Safe Haven, um, which was discussed at the board meeting, uh, the full board meeting last week. Um, I, I think we believe that there are um, zoning issues uh, which ought to be addressed, uh, although we I think everyone is more or less everyone is in agreement that it is a project that um, uh, that uh, is, uh, as someone said, meritorious, and that we should um, that we should find uh, a, at least find out uh, what the uh, what the story is on that. And um, with that in mind, uh, it will be a. Um, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get a presentation on the zoning issues um, such as they are um, uh, at our meeting next next month. And then totally new business. And I think if Max can um, uh, put it in the chat, um, uh, Corey Johnson has made a proposal for a new comprehensive city plan. Uh, which would involve a sort of uh, a turnover of city plan every 10 years. And I think that, um, again, we think, because we, we've talked about it a little bit among ourselves, it was released uh, in mid-December, just, just in time for no one to pay attention to it. And um, so if, uh, oh, thank you, Max. Max has put the uh, website in the chat, and I believe that, or we believe that all interested people should take a good hard look at it and reserve some time because it's not short. And, um, and, I, and that will also be a topic uh, uh, for our meeting next, uh, next month. And um, if there is other new business, if there's not other new business, I suspect as it's 826, we can, uh, I think Elizabeth and I would happily entertain um, a motion to adjourn. I see Gail and Rita waving their hands. Um, second. Great. Um, uh, Ed Hartzog. So um, uh, if there is no, no objection, great. Then we're adjourned and we will see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. All 70 of you. So yes, I don't there were 125 want to... at one point. Yes, yeah, so I don't want the idea that nobody came because nobody cared. A lot of you came because you cared, and thank you very much. Thank you.